got any sort of compromised skin anywhere on the body. I also use this on my pets when they develop rashes. Um, so basically the, the products in here include um, our new gel water. I'm going to pass this around. So it comes with three individual sterile 50 years orally to heal stomach ulcers. So it actually will speed up the process of um, re-epithelialization always a hard one, re-epithelialization and granulization. So basically it makes wounds close quicker. You know, I don't know where sucrophate comes from. I don't know. I'll find that out. No, it's, it's basically it's been used for, yeah, yeah. But I'll look up actually where it derives from because I don't know that, that answer. Yeah, all I know is that it's been around forever orally for, yeah for healing wounds inside the body. Um, so then there are two additional products and these are basically, um, so Aven is the only company in the world that has sterile uh, cosmeceuticals. So what that means is, um, and I'll actually pass this around so you can get a sense of the packaging. Sterile means um, it's manufactured sterile, it's packaged sterile, and then we're the only company that actually has sterile packaging so when you open this up, it's best if you do it upside down, that way you don't spray it anywhere. You'll see there's a separate little nozzle that'll come out. It, it allows the product to come out, but it, inside it closes itself up so that nothing, no bacteria can get in. So there's basically just seven ingredients in this, no preservatives, no scent, no soap, no nothing. Just literally seven ingredients. It stays sterile forever. So there's no expiration date, but it's ideal for people who have either highly reactive skin. So there are people who will use this just as their normal routine washing and uh, moisturizing, but obviously perfect for somebody who's gone home whose skin is, um, is compromised. And after you've done this beautiful work on them, you don't want them going home and using, you know, Dove or their um, dial soap on their face and messing up what you've done. So the entire kit is something they should be sent home with in terms of, um, so the water can be used anytime as much as they want. Uh, the sickle fate would be used in particular the first couple of days while they still have the, the really sensitive, um, you know, maybe some um, uh, you know, open areas where the skin has been more ablated, more roughly treated. Then using the cleanser and the um, conditioner on days, say three, four, Sorry, moisturizer, not conditioner. So basically the, the whole kit um, takes them through, you know, the next few weeks if they're doing a series. This is basically what is going to get them healing faster, being more comfortable, so they are happier with you and your service because they're not, they're not dealing with really, really dry, uncomfortable skin. They're not dealing with hot skin. So more comfort, faster healing, happier with you, ready to go on to the, the next peel and, or sorry, the next uh, laser in a series. As a point of reference, so I printed this out. This is from the American Board of Laser Surgery. On it, they have uh, standard forms. This one is, uh, as an example, their Fraxel Restore. So this is something that they provide to their physician members as sort of guidelines for what they think is the best way to handle various procedures. If you would read from that highlighted there, so this is their advice immediately post-treatment. Immediately after treatment, you will leave the office with the Avene SOS complete post-procedure recovery kit. The skin medicus, TNS recovery complex approved sunblock, and the Theracurl face mask if given. Start with using the thermal spring water gel and cool with water spray multiple times per day. You should also ice your skin as much as possible. Also in the kit is the sickle face for anti-redness and moisturizer. Use this in addition to the gel multiple times per day. The night of Procedure, you see a bean cleansing lotion to wash the skin and a bean tolerance extra cream or extreme cream. That's what you got yeah. Tolerance extreme. For cooling and moisturizing. Also multiple times per day. Starting on the day after the procedure, add the skin medica TNS recovery complex on cleansed skin, cleanse with a bean cleansing lotion twice per day. Follow the sickle fade and tolerance extreme cream. Thank you very much, Kylie. So um, basically, I just wanted to point that out because it's basically the Aven SOS kit is kind of considered the gold standard in terms of post uh, procedure, anything where the skin has been traumatized because of, uh, again, Aven, the water healing, the um, sterile cleanser, sterile lotion, the um, sucrolfate, which actually helps speed up the, the healing process. 
Any questions on the products or, yeah? Do you have anything that the company manufactures related to these people? Because I think people that come back all the time are like, I don't know what to do with this. All the time. Yeah, um, and that's part of the reason I'm here because there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of ingredients in that. So, so um, you just get a sheet that says when to use yes. ingredients? Yes. That way they know? Yeah. Yeah, I will do that. Um, we have a question. Yep. Now, the cleansing lotion, do they just put it on? Do they wipe it off? Yes, yeah, so thank you for bringing that up. So the Tolerance Extreme Cleansing Lotion is what we consider a no-rinse lotion. Event actually has, f I mean, a no-rinse cleanser. Event actually has five of those. Um, so it is just applied on the face with the fingers, you know, lightly circular motions, and then it can be removed with a cotton square. Um, you can rinse it off, but a lot of people, you know, there, there is sensitivity uh, immediately afterwards. Well, not immediately, but for a few days afterwards. It's sometimes water, depending on what your water is like here. It could leave deposits, salt, etc. So a lot of people prefer to not rinse. So it's a rinse-free. Yeah. Oh, so you have to wipe it off, though? Because I don't know if the CO2 person is going to want to wipe it off. Yeah, so, so that might be something. So tell me about, a little bit about how soon after, how long after they've had the treatment are, are they going to be? Yes. Okay. So yeah, they can, they can, you can also use the spray water to just sort of mist it and damp it, tamp it off. It does not have to come off. I mean, it's a sterile product. Um, it's basically just meant to, um, you know, to, to keep the area clean. That's the part that is Okay. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, okay, I just put this product on my face. Now you're telling me to wash my well, face. Well, so that's it's, like, yeah. That's so it's usually, part. yeah. Okay. So it's usually a few days later when they're starting to use more of the, the cleanser versus, so I will spell all of that out. Yeah, that's, yeah, that is, that is good feedback for me to get because, yeah, there's things that are sort of like so inherent in our head. Uh-huh. Yeah, and then the sickle fate can be used more spot treatment where there are still sores and wounds. Um, and the sickle fate is just great to have around the house for everything. I mean, it's basically sort of a sporin with healing ingredients versus just protective. But where you have the steps when it only does it gets that one step two, three, step four, and it doesn't stay starting. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, I appreciate that feedback. You're right. Thank you for letting me chat. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Now, if you search online, one of the most searched topics is scars, because um, when people get a scar, they, it's very emotionally traumatic for them. And if you go on Real Self, there's page after page after page about scar, scar treatments. And our videos that we do here in the office, I, I, from what I understand, the scar ones are the ones that are searched the most. So as a dermatologist, we are really experts in scar treatments, and especially in a practice like this where we have all the devices on the market to help improve the scars. So what, what causes a scar? Well, first thing we know is if you, you fall down and you, you damage the deep dermis, the deeper part of the skin, that's gonna lead to a scar. 
Now, if you just damage the superficial part of the skin, it regenerates itself and there's no scar. Um, secondly, if you have surgery that goes, again, deep into the dermis, you, you get a scar. Um, third thing is if you get a severe burn, again, deep into the tissue, you can get a, you can get a scar. Infections that go um, untreated can lead to a scar. And also inflammatory conditions like acne, um, connective tissue diseases like lupus, um, hair disorders like lichen plana pilaris, all of these things can lead to scars. So what factors influence <coughs> scarring? Well, first, one of the first factors is age. Do you think a younger person heals better or an older person? I wonder. Who said? Somebody said younger, somebody said older. Older people actually heal better with less scarring. And it's due to, during, there, there are three phases of, of healing. And um, during these phases, there's, there's a buildup and a breakdown to remodel the scars. So you're building up the collagen and then you're tearing it down and you're remodeling it. So it's this whole cycle that we go through. It's called a um, catabolic and anabolic, you know, tearing down and breaking up. So actually older people scar better. And it's interesting because HIV positive people also scar better. Um, you know, because they have less inflammation. Race, there is a racial component. Does anybody know what the racial component is? So is, if you, it, who, who do you think is going to have um, less risk of scarring? Lawrence or me? Me. Why is that? Because of the keloid. It's the risk of keloiding. In darker skin types, there's, there's an increased risk of keloiding. Um, the orientation of a scar is also a huge factor. If a scar follows in our, falls in our skin tension lines, it's going to heal up much better than if it crosses the skin tension lines. And we, we will be putting a graph in there to show what that is. And when you smile, older people, you can see their skin tension lines. Because like when I smile, I get creases that go this way. So my tension lines are this way. So if I'm going with those tension lines, I'm gonna have a better scar than if I cross them. And like older women, if they put, push their chest together, you can see the lines forming on their chest. Have you ever noticed that? It, okay, all the white people are going yes, all the darker skin people are going, never seen a wrinkle in my grandma, what are you talking about? So, um, but, but it is true, you can see the skin tension lines. And also when we're doing surgery on a back, if we have a person stretch their shoulders back, and I do this here where it's mostly white people, and I can always see their lines. I teach at USC, and when I have the Hispanic guys do this, I'm like, I can't see the lines. So anyway, orientation. And then also medical conditions, like if, if you're a poor wound healer, if you have things like diabetes, you can have uh, poor wound healing as well. And also location on the body. So uh, before we start the talk, I want to talk about prevention. Uh, what are some of the preventative measures you can use to minimize your scarring? Does anybody in the audience want to help me out here? Keep it moist. Keep it moist, yes. Moist wounds heal it better than dry wounds. The old adage was if it's wet, dry, if it's dry, wet it. But the reality is we want to have uh, um, surfaces that are, are traumatized or surgical sites moist. Um, number two, does anybody know? Sunscreen. Sunscreen. Good. Don't pick the area exactly. Don't pick it. Keep it greasy. And then the other thing is, once it's healed, what can we do? So there are silicone gel sheets and silicone uh, scar creams that you can use on it, which minimize your scarring. Okay, so we're going to talk about scar characteristics, because the characteristic of, uh, characteristics of your scar determine the path that we're going to use to treat them. So we want to first start out by talking about now we can get red scars, and then hyperpigment, which are dark scars. And I like this picture because here you can see that this guy has pretty severe acne. And you'll see this when people come in, they'll say, sometimes I just have a red spot or a brown spot or a light spot. Darker skinned people oftentimes come in with just a dark spot on their skin, and they're like, I have a scar here. The reality is it hasn't really damaged the collagen or anything like that. Um, but they just don't like the pigmentation. If it's just pigmentation irregularity, dark or red, it will go away on its own ultimately. But um, you know, this is one reason we want to catch things really. Acne can be prevented by Accutane, so we want to catch it before it turns into actual scarring. Because scars still are forever, and even with the greatest technology that we have now, we can never have a person with scars um, have normal looking skin again. 
So next thing we have is we have, um, are they raised, flat, depressed, or stretched? So a raised scar is where it's raised up above the skin surface. Um, we have flat scars where there's even with the skin surface. We have depressed scars where they're below the skin surface. And then we also have characteristics where the scars just stretch. And this is, this is the biggest problem, and this is based on two things. Stretching scars is based on two characteristics. First one is, is it in an area of high tension? Like if you're, you're back, you're doing this all day long. Uh, if you're stretching it, it will pull the scar apart. And the second thing is, in younger people, the reason they don't heal well is because young people have a lot of elasticity in their skin. So for a young person, if you cut their skin, it will recoil because they have so much elasticity in their skin. An older person like me, when you cut my skin, it just sort of lays there. So it's not pulling against itself. And that's one reason that they, they stretch. Okay, so for raised scars, what we um, also have is we have hypertrophic scar versus a keloid scar. And the difference between these two is people always tell me I, I have keloids. I have to be careful when I do surgery because I have a keloid. And I'm always like, show me your scar. And they'll show me one on their knee where things don't heal particularly well. And um, I'm like, that's not a keloid. It's just not a pretty scar, but it's not a keloid. Or they'll show me um, a, a stretch scar and they think it's a keloid. It's not a keloid. A keloid is a, a hypertrophic scar is a scar that stays in within the boundaries of the initial trauma. A keloid, however, is a scar that stretches way beyond the initial trauma. So, for example, if you get your ear pierced, you've got this huge hanging ball off your earlobe, and you'll see this all the time. I teach at USC, like I said, and we see it all the time in our Latin and African American um, patients, where there are these huge things that hang off. Or you'll see these guys with these, we'll see in a little bit, or maybe a little bit, but they have these plaques across their chest, and we're like, what happened? They said, I had acne scar, I had acne on my chest. And it, they just coalesce and they merge in together and lead to horrible scarring. Atrophic scars are where um, you just have no, you, you have loss of dermis underneath and they're sort of depressed. So, and when we talk about acne scars, these are depressed type scars. We have box scar scars, ice pick scars, and rolling scars. And so the way you can tell if it's rolling versus these two is if you stretch the skin and the scar disappears, that's a rolling scar. If you, have, if you try to stretch the scar and it just stays, it means a very, it's a very fibrotic scar and it's gonna be much more difficult to treat. Because with the rolling scars, we'll have lots of treatment options and that'll include fillers and lasers and stuff like that that we'll talk about in a minute. For the ice pick and box scar, they're, they're scarred all the way around and it's difficult to make a difference in them. And then we also have the raised scars, which we talked about it a minute ago. So this is sort of what they look like. Ice pick looks like they just took a uh, ice pick and stuck it in there. Box scar means it has a just squared boxy looking pattern. The rolling is more just a little circular depression and then the hypertrophic, which is raised. Okay, so with scars, you know, one of the things I always ask people is, what bothers you about your scar? Because it, it varies from person to person. So some, somebody might say, I don't like the color. Some people will say, I don't like the texture. Some people, I don't like the fact that it casts shadows on my skin when I'm in light. So first thing we talk about is what color is it? Reds are easy to treat. And uh, when you get rid of the redness, it sort of will blend in. Because if you look at this, this, if it were flesh colored, would not be that noticeable, right? But it's the fact that it's red that it stands out. And here's a, does anybody know what this is from? Tummy tuck scar. They're lucky because the belly button doesn't look that bad. But all of these we can treat with our lasers that target reds. And in our practice, we're fortunate we have three lasers that target, target reds. Well, two lasers, the XLV, which is a KTP laser, and it's very effective at targeting reds, and then the V-beam. The V-beam has multiple studies showing its efficacy in treating scars. It's great for treating reds, and it also helps to remodel the fibrous network in a scar. So it actually helps to, to, to get the scars to look more normal in terms of the collagen and also the color. And then we also have the IPL. IPL is not a laser. Why is it not a laser? It's a light source, which means it has multiple wavelengths, whereas these two have single wavelengths. Okay, so now we've got uh, darker skin type again here and lasers that are just brown. And uh, you'll see this with even, there's uh, pigmenting from leg vein treatments. And because it's, it's uh, the, the pigmentation leaks out in the tissue leading to uh, iron deposits in the skin. 
So here what we can use is we can use the tattoo laser. And now we have a new great laser, the Pico Way Better laser, right? And that helps to break up the pigment into tiny little pieces. And also, again, here, if we use the tattoo laser, we can help to get rid of that discoloration. And then it'll blend in a lot better. And then we also have the XLB, which is a 532 nanometer wavelength, which actually targets reds and browns. So that's a nice feature about that laser. OK, so hypopigmented. Who's most likely to hypopigment or lose their pigment? Can anybody tell me? I, uh, what skin type? We have one, two, three, four, from lightest to darkest. Who's going to lose their pigment? Yeah. Which is the lightest skin types. Why is that? Does anybody know? OK. The, 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 the melanocytes aren't as um, robust. So if a, if a really, if a, the person who goes out in the sun and doesn't get a tan, they burn, that's because their pigment cells aren't very aggressive. So that means they're, I always say that they're more fragile. So in a lighter skinned person that get the porcelain white scars, it's a disaster. And you'll see this in facelift patients and in Mohs patients, having a porcelain white scar makes it very, very, very obvious. So we do have a couple treatment options available. One is to use Latisse. Has anybody used Latisse and gotten the dark circles underneath their eyes in the room? Okay, we have two people. Did yours stop or did it keep? So did you have to stop? Yeah, me too. I can't do it. So it, it may help to repigment. The other thing is we have this thing called the extract laser, which is a UVB wavelength. Thank you, Lee. It's a UVB wavelength. And what, what it does is it actually helps to stimulate the, the pigment cells. Will it work or not? We don't know. But we do use it for vitiligo, and we may see some improvement. But hypopigmentation is a tough phenomenon to treat. Okay, so we have raised scars, um, hypertrophic scars from burns, and um, keloids. Now, these are the raised scars. So we have lots of treatment options. Now, when we're in this situation, these people need to go to a plastic surgeon, and they'll probably need to do grafting, skin grafting, excisions, things like that. But for our smaller you know, surgical scars that we tr treat, we can do injections. Now, the ones that are most commonly used are going to be 5-FU, 5-FU is an anti-metabolite. The idea is that it's calming your fibroblasts down so that they're not producing excessive amounts of collagen, which are what cause a scar. Kenalog, again, is a treatment option that we use to help calm those fibroblasts down so we can get, get the scars to flatten out. We can also, if they're um, really heaped up, we can re-excise them. Now, this is fine for a scar that's not a keloid. But if you have a keloid, the chance of recurrence is going to be very high. It's 50%. And the problem with excising a scar that's a keloid is if you do excise it and you have a 50% chance that it's coming back, is it going to come back less aggressive with a bigger traumatic event or not? It's going to be much more aggressive. And I had a girl this weekend at, at USC, and she had just an ear piercing. She got a big chunk. We took it off. The, her whole ear got involved, and she wants to re-excise it. So we can... Um, Excise and use radiation in addition. This decreases the recurrence rate to about 10 to 20 percent as opposed to 50 percent. Um, for uh, keloids, if we remove them from the ear, you can buy compression earrings. And by applying the compression, that reduces the, the risk of scarring. As I mentioned, we always want to use silicone dressings anytime you're concerned about scarring. We can also take freezing. And the idea is if we freeze the keloid or the scar, it'll traumatize those fibroblasts, which are producing the collagen that form the scar. Now, this to me, I used to do, but the problem is keloids are more prone to occur in darker skinned people. And so when you do the freezing on top of it, it causes problems with the pigmentation. So you end up with a flatter scar, but you end up with more hyperpigmentation or darkening of that area, which is not good. And then what we can do is we can also use a CO2 to help break up the scarring or flatten down a scar. So these are some of the other options that we have for a raised scar. We can do dermabrasion, which is just taking and mechanically debriding the top of the scar. This works great if it's not um, a, a keloid. We would never do it in a keloid. CO2, again, after a surgical scar, we can just burn down the top of the, the scar with a CO2 laser. And then we also have derma sanding. And derma sanding is like derma, dermabrasion, except with a dermabrasion, you use a machine. With the derma sanding, you just use autoclaved or sterilized sandpaper. For rolling scars, and these are, you know, these are the kind of scars that people are gonna, that are going to drive people crazy. 
the acne scars on the face, because this is the area where people see your face. And if you have these rolling scars, they're great because we can do a combination of therapy. We can do injectables to try to lift these up. We can also do a subcision, which means we take a blade, and I need a picture of that, a blade where we put it underneath the skin and we swipe that little dent underneath the skin. What this does is it lifts up the scar and it also creates a ball of collagen underneath the scar, making it a flatter um, surface. And then um, with, with the fillers, we can use anything from Restylane, Restylane Silk, which is a smaller molecule, to silicone. But it really does lift up these scars. And one of the biggest problems with this is shadowing. Do you ever have that situation where something doesn't bother you until you see yourself in a certain light, and then you see yourself in that light and you're like, it becomes a big deal? What's the best solution for that? <laughs> Dunk on that light, right? <laughs> okay. And then, um, so once we've, once we've done a little bit of filler underneath the scar to lift them up, what we can do is we can actually um, try to level out the rest of the skin. So what's going on here is you have this part of the skin higher than the depressed part. So if we actually bring this down to be more of an even level on both sides, um, it'll make it less shadows and, and look more attractive. And we can do that with the dermabrasion, the CO2. We also have a new radio frequency device called the sublative. And with this one, it's great because it only traumatizes 5% of the surface of the skin, and then it da damages 30% of the tissue be below. And these help to shrink and tighten the skin and make those scars disappear. And we also have erbium lasers, which are less aggressive than a CO2 that we can use. Ice pick scars are really a challenge. You know, these, um, you know, when I was training, what we were told to do is we were told to punch them out and close them. The problem with that is when you cut these out, there's scar tissue all the way around. So scar tissue is devitalized, which means it doesn't have a good blood supply to it. And so when you cut this out and you bring the edges together, there's not blood supply coming to both sides. And what happens is they just pop open. And I can tell you from this one that I have on my face, I've tried twice and it's popped open both times. And I've done this to multiple people and it, you know, it, just, they, it just doesn't work. The other thing that we can do is we can actually punch and float. So what you do is you punch this out and instead of pulling the tissue out, you just lift it up a little bit. And that's called a punch and float. Never saw that work very well. The third technique, and none of these are great, because I've tried them all and none of them are great. The third technique is the cross technique. And that's where what we do is we take a little drop of high concentration um, chemical peeling agent like uh, TCA, and we put it in there. What it does is it causes a, a wound to form. And the idea is that you're causing a wound and it's gradually building up collagen inside that depressed scar. Again, I've just seen it leak out into the surrounding area and cause a burn around the scar and making it more noticeable. I don't know how other people do it. Okay, and so um, the other thing that we can do is if a scar is not oriented in the right direction and it's contracting and pulling, what we can do is we can do a Z-plasty, and I need a picture of a Z-plasty. And what we can do here is we can sort of reorient it to be more in the skin tension lines and to sort of take out that contraction and make the scar look a lot better. And then there are other options out there. Um, there are things like interferon, uh, transforming growth factor injections, um, these other treatment options that we that are in, in studies. They're expensive and they're not really use that much. We also can use things like calcium channel blockers and um, bleomycin, all sorts of different things. So did you guys have any questions? I did. Yes. What, what about the sublative? Uh, the sublative, that was the one that I was talking about here, where we talked about the radio frequency. Oh, okay. That's yeah, yeah. So I think that that's a great one. And what's the best about the radio frequency, and I forgot to mention this, is it's colorblind. And so if you have acne scars and you're um, a type 2, type 3, Latin, Hispanic, Mediterranean, it really limits your use of the, the resurfacing techniques like dermabrasion and carbon dioxide laser because it can lead to long-term hyperpigmentation. Um, so it, it, it really is difficult for people to get that kind of downtime. Yes, Lawrence. When you said um, when you treat chelo scars, you said you can do, um, in conjunction with the sizing of the radiation, Yes. The radiation cause um, more of a damage of the scar and Okay, the idea is, okay, when we talk about this, we don't know exactly what causes it, but we do know that in a keloid scar, what's happening is you're getting aggressive healing. Like your skin is overproducing collagen to try to replace that scar, right? And so with this, what's producing the, the, the scar? It's the fibroblasts, okay? So any of these treatment options we're using are trying to calm those fibroblasts down so that they don't produce more collagen. 
So radiation damages cells. So radiation is used in, in terms of cancer, I'll be right with you, to kill the, the rapidly dividing cells, right? So what it's doing in this case is it's damaging those fibroblasts which are producing the, the, the scar tissue. So you cut it out and then you're right there where the fibroblasts are. So you're killing them or slowing them down so that they don't produce more collagen. Does that make sense? Right, but would it leave like a, you know we see some people with the radiation they have that pain Yes. Yes, it will. It can lead to the radiation scar look, but the whole idea is you're debulking because if you have these raised scars that are like really thick, that's what people want to get rid of. So it's not a perfect solution, but it does. You know, like this poor girl, her ear is like a, a um, it's like a grapefruit on her face now. So she'd rather have a radiation burn, and she could put her hair over it because now, I mean, imagine being intimate and somebody touches her ear. It's like. If that's a conversation, right? <laughs> when you're not wanting to have one. <laughs> yes, Lee. I'm, I'm sorry. 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 What, what was that, Lee? Erbium laser would be the fraxel. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. People ask about Mederma all the time because it's a scar um, treatment. The, um, there, there are some minor studies that say that it works, Mederma. The active ingredient is onion extract. But every study that's done shows that silicone, well, not every study, but the majority of studies always point to silicone being the best treatment option. Now, I'll start over here, LaRue. You know, the, how do keloids form? We don't know. I mean, it, it's just probably maybe a genetic predisposition. We don't know. But there's this balance where your body is building up collagen and then breaking it down and forming different types of collagen. So it goes from type 3 to type 1. And so there could be a loss of control of breaking the scar down to rebuild it, or there could just be an overproliferation where it's building too much scar tissue, or it could be the combination, building too much and not tearing down at all. So, but you do see, you know, and it, it's not that um, white people can't get them because there are Caucasians that can get them. It's just more common in African Americans. Yes. So if a patient has a keloid and we bring it down and it's nice and flat, is there a chance that it can go back? A keloid? Yes. 50%. 50%. Yes. And a question over here somewhere? No. Yes. Oh, the microdermabrasion. Uh, excuse me, the, the pinwheel, yes. And that, that's actually terrific for um, breaking up scar tissue. And so I need to add that too. Um, but it is really great, especially in acne type scars. It really helps to break it up. Or in thicker scars, it'll help to break it, break it up a little bit as well. And we're talking about the derma roller and derma pen. It's funny because I just talked about how I needed a picture of it. And then I didn't even have it in the talk. Yes. Okay. It